Hey guys, it's Sunny Brigham here. Um, for those of you joining me for the very first time, I am a board certified clinical and integrative nutritionist who specializes in gut health. And uh, I'm going live tonight. It is Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Central and I go live every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Central to talk about current nutrition topics and uh, current information on the blog. Um, so let me go ahead and post the blog. This is I'm actually live streaming from my computer. I've never done this before. I usually use my phone, uh, so you'll have to forgive me if I screw something up. Por favor. Okay, so we'll post the blog here. I think it's already posted above, but I'm going to post it again anyway. Oh, that was not supposed to happen. I opened another window there. All right, we're pinning that comment. Okay, so this seems to work better because, oh, look at this guy right here. See if I can circle him. I'm going backwards. Oh, and there's another one. They're all coming for some reason. Okay. So anyway, tonight we are uh, we're discussing inflammation in the body, and we're going to talk about ginger and turmeric and what that can do to help reduce inflammation. So we've got the blog up in the comments. If you have any questions as we're going along, go ahead and post them, and I will be sure uh, to answer them for you. Apologize for all the loudness in the animals. Hopefully you guys can hear me pretty well. Um, all right, so let's start and just talk about inflammation in general. Um, so when we talk about inflammation, we usually think of um, joints being inflamed or cuts on the skin or things of that nature. We don't ever really think about inside, aside from joints or painful areas. A lot of times inflammation can run rampant and we don't really know it or maybe we're not even really thinking about it because we don't really know the signs and symptoms of inflammation outside of the standard run of the mill pain. And so if you think about, you know, I always use this analogy, if you think about on the surface of the skin, if you get a cut or something like that, um, the immune system wants to repair, make sure that there's no, you know, critters coming in through that cut. And so it kicks off an inflammatory response in the body and it sends all the good juju to that area so that it can start to repair. And you see it starts to get swollen and it maybe it's a little painful for a few days. Um, those same processes happen inside the body and they happen inside the body a lot when we eat foods that we're not supposed to. So 80% of your immune system lies within your small intestine. And so your small intestine is where the magic really happens when we talk about food digestion um, and nutrient absorption. And so if 80% of the immune system lies within the small intestine and we're taking in a lot of fast food and cookies and cakes and sugars and dairy and eggs and corn and all these things that can be inflammatory to the, dig to the digestive tract, we're kicking off an immune response creating inflammation in the small intestine every time we consume one of those foods. Now, if you picture what's happening on the surface of the skin, when you have inflammation on the surface of the skin, you know, you've got the burning, you've got the pain, you've got the swelling, that same thing happens in the small intestine. And so when we have inflammation in the small intestine, there's things that are, are leaking out into the body that should never be there by way of pathogens on the food or preservatives that we're eating. Things that should have left the body by way of the feces are now in the bloodstream and attacking cells or changing the shape of them and causing problems, specifically inflammation. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So the main foods that cause inflammation are sugar, um, gluten, although that's not for everybody. Some people consume gluten like a champ. Some people can't touch the stuff. Um, I find that eggs, surprisingly, can be inflammatory for a lot of people. It's really specifically the egg white. Um, and so we cut that out of some people's diets and they feel amazing. Um, processed meats, so you're talking like hot dogs, um, lunch meats, those sorts of things, refined carbohydrates, so white bread, cookies, cakes, candies, all the wonderful things that we all want to eat. Um, dairy, dairy is a really big one. Most people have a problem with dairy when they cut it out of their diet. They notice that they have less bloat, they have less diarrhea episodes, less gas, and overall they just feel a lot better. So um, when I have a client in the office. Um, sorry, you have to forgive me. I'm super fidgety tonight for some reason. So uh, when I have a client in the office that is clearly exhibiting signs of inflammation, we always talk about removing certain foods from the diet and then seeing how they feel um, as time goes on. 
And so some of the symptoms that I will see in my office that immediately alert me to we probably need to change up the diet because we've got some internal inflammation going on is um, elevated cholesterol levels, uh, hypertension or high blood pressure, joint inflammation is a big one, and uh, joint inflammation or pain that is not due to injury. So if you haven't recently hurt yourself, if you don't have an old football knee injury, anything like that, you just kind of have, I don't know why, but all of a sudden my my hips hurt and my back hurts and my elbows hurt or things are a little crickety in the morning when I try to get going and they're a little stiff and painful, that's an indication that there's probably some inflammation on the inside going on. Um, skin issues, I see this a lot. So just, you know, atopic dermatitis or eczema is a big one. Um, Typically, we'll remove things from the diet, clients that have eczema, and we keep it that way until their eczema clears. It's usually within two to four weeks, and then we'll start adding some foods back in and finding what food or foods was the culprit. Um, bloating. This is a big one. I feel like a lot of people just accept that they have bloat without really thinking about why or trying to relate it to certain foods. Um, if you feel that you get stuffed easily very quickly or you have that like thanksgiving stuffed feeling after almost every meal or you notice you've got some belly distension or it's very hard to the touch that's a good indication that you've got some bloating going on if it just happens on occasion you know a one-off instance that's not a big deal but if it's a consistent happening fairly regularly bloating that's probably something that you want to get checked into um, as far as <clears throat> finding foods that are causing the bloating and healing the digestive tract. Um, loose stools or diarrhea. So on the rare occasion, that's perfectly fine if you have an acute episode of diarrhea or loose stools. Happens to the best of us. But if it's like an everyday occurrence to where when you get a normal stool, you're celebrating, that's probably a good indication. You've got some digestive uh, concerns going on. Abdominal pain, usually, especially in the lower abdomen. Um, increased anxiety or depression. So most of our, I shouldn't say most, so a lot of our serotonin and our GABA is produced in the small intestine as well. So when we've kind of got digestive problems running rampant and maybe we already have anxiety or depression or maybe we're prone to it, because of past occurrences that maybe we didn't handle appropriately or we didn't get um, help or assistance with those, or maybe we have um, familial link to anxiety and depression, we can actually exacerbate those by having uh, digestive problems because we're not able to produce the serotonin that we need, which is our happy hormone. And then bad bacteria in, this, in the gut actually feeds on our GABA. So as the GABA is being created, we're not able to use it. It's not being transported to the brain to do what it's supposed to do. The bad bacteria is eating it up before it can get a chance to ever, you know, help us feel better. Trouble sleeping. Um, this is a big one. Migraines and then weight gain. So um, weight gain will happen as we age. It's just, you know, uh, especially if after you pass age 30, your metabolism starts to slow down. So it's not uncommon to put on a couple of pounds every year. But if you're putting on like five pounds, you didn't change your diet, and then that five turns into 10, that 10 turns into 20, and you still haven't changed your diet at all, um, that's probably a good indication that we've got some gut impairment going on. Could be some other things, but if you take the weight gain paired with the bloating and the diarrhea or the persistent constipation and the skin issues and the joint pain, there's a good cycle of symptoms there showing that we probably have some um, inflammation going on inside the body. All righty, so let us talk about how we can use turmeric and ginger to reduce the inflammation. So as a nutritionist, when I want to reduce your inflammation, the first thing I want to do is to remove these offending foods. But we're not talking about elimination diets or autoimmune protocols tonight. We're talking about how you can use ginger and turmeric to reduce some of the inflammation. So um, let's talk about ginger first. And I'm referencing my blog so that I can make sure that I get all of the information out to you that I put in the blog. If you don't know, every Monday at 10 a.m. a new blog is posted on my website. And, uh, and then we talk about it on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Central via Facebook Live, which is what we're doing now. So let's talk about ginger first. 
Okay, so ginger is awesome for a lot of things. It is great to aid in digestion. I love to have ginger tea in the evening. I like to pair it with lemon as well, so I have a ginger lemon tea. Um, my husband swears it tastes like, and I can't even think of the name right now, uh, Theraflu. That's it. He swears it tastes like Theraflu. I don't really think so. I think it tastes like uh, ginger and um, ginger and uh, lemon is what I think it tastes like, and I think it tastes amazing. So ginger promotes uh, the release of saliva in the mouth. We need saliva because it has all of the wonderful digestive enzymes that start digestion in the mouth. And so if you cook with ginger, if you drink ginger tea, um, you're going to start the digestive process where it should, which is in the mouth. Um, ginger also promotes gastric emptying. So this is great too. So a lot of us suffer from gastroparesis, which is um, our stomach doesn't really release all of the food that's sitting in the stomach. And so other food kind of sits in there and it stays there where it shouldn't stay until the next course of food comes in, then it finally releases that uh, previous course and then the other food just kind of sits in there. And so what ginger does is it causes um, the stomach to do what it's supposed to do and allow for the food to empty into the small intestine so that we can continue digestion and utilizing all of the wonderful nutrients that are in our food. Um, it's really good because if you have some post-meal bloating, I find that ginger lemon tea mixed together really helps to reduce post-meal bloating. It also helps um, if you have kind of end of day bloating where you may, may not wake up bloated, but throughout the course of the day and at the end of the day, you end up a little bloated. I always find that ginger uh, lemon tea mixture is always really good to help reduce some bloating. Um, ginger, a lot of people don't know this, has been shown to reduce um, LDL, triglycerides, and your total cholesterol readings. Now, I've talked about this before. So LDL and triglycerides are not actually cholesterol, but they are pulled into the cholesterol panel when you go get your labs drawn. Total cholesterol is the only cholesterol there is. LDL is a low-density lipoprotein. Yeah, low-density lipoprotein. Sorry, I had a brain fart there for a minute. Um, and they're kind of like the cars that drive the cholesterol around through um, – the body. And then triglycerides is actually a fat, but because uh, it it's a good fat to measure because if we're eating a lot of um, refined carbohydrates, taking in a lot of sugar, um, or maybe we're having a little too much alcohol, it'll show up in our triglyceride levels. Um, but ginger can actually bring those down. Um, dietary cholesterol really actually has very little effect on your overall cholesterol levels. If we take in too much cholesterol through food, our body will pull back on processing cholesterol because we create about 80% of our own cholesterol that we make. Um, so if we take in more, our body will create less. But um, if we have inflammation, kind of gets confused and things get out of whack and we start continuing to create more and more and more cholesterol. Um, inflammation affects the liver and we process all cholesterol through the liver. So a lot of that has to do with that. Uh, let's see. What other fun facts I can throw at you tonight? Ooh, here's a fun study. So ginger has been shown to be just as effective as a standard steroid treatment and more effective than NSAIDs, which are non-steroid anti-inflammatories, uh, when utilizing it as an anti-inflammatory in joint pain. So if you have joint pain, I'd go ahead and whip up some ginger tea and relax instead of reaching for the NSAID because the NSAIDs can actually cause inflammation in the small intestine. So if your joint pain is directly related to uh, inflammation in the intestine and you are taking in uh, Tylenol and NSAIDs and things like that, you're just kind of feeding into the inflammatory process. So the pain may go away, but all the stuff that's happening on the back end is still happening and it's starting to get a little out of control. So NSAIDs are really just band-aids, they're not fixing the problem. Um, and then ginger is just great reducing overall inflammation. So when we go to the physician and we get our annual physical as everybody should be doing and you get your labs drawn, um, <clears throat> if I send a client to a physician, I really like for them to get specific labs. 
And one of them that I ask for is either um, C-reactive protein or high-sensitive C-reactive protein. So that tells us how much inflammation is in our body. So next time you go to the physician and they say, hey, it's time for your labs, why don't you say, can we pull a CRP doc? And the doc will say, right on. And ginger can actually reduce your CRP levels. So that's ginger in a nutshell. Let's talk turmeric. So turmeric, like ginger, is also an anti-inflammatory. Um, it acts to reduce the actual inflammatory response in the body, uh, especially for individuals that have chronic inflammation. So people that have digestive problems, I really like for them to do like a turmeric latte or combine it and let's do a turmeric ginger latte or a tea. Um, and ginger or turmeric, because we're on a turmeric now, has been shown to reduce digestive inflammation. Um, so that's good for individuals with IBS because IBS is irritable bowel syndrome. That's where our digestive tract is inflamed. It's usually the large intestine. And so turmeric uh, is good for that, a turmeric latte. Um, oxidative stress, oh, this is a good one. So oxidative stress, which sets off the inflammatory response, one of the many things that sets off the inflammatory response. So oxidative stress is bad, we don't want that. <clears throat> um, we'll set off the inflammatory response and it is one factor in chronic inflammation and actually turmeric can react on oxidative stress. So turmeric acts as an antioxidant in this capacity um, and reduces the inflammatory response. So that's how uh, turmeric, I keep wanting to say ginger because we just talked about ginger. That's how turmeric acts on inflammation. Well, hey buddy, what are you doing? Oh, it's my little dog. Okay, so here's a fun fact for you that turmeric is, it's wonderful, it's a great spice, we can use it in a lot of things, but curcumin, which is actually the active ingredient in turmeric, is the one that gives it its golden hue and its anti-inflammatory properties. And in order for curcumin to act appropriately in the body, we want to pair it with two things. We want to pair it with black pepper and we want to pair it with a fat. Usually coconut oil is going to be the tastiest or a coconut fat milk. So like a full fat canned coconut milk. Um, so it, not to say it won't be effective if you take curcumin or turmeric alone, but the best way to take it to get the maximum absorbency is adding it with a black pepper and a fat. So on the blog, if you click it in the comments, there are two recipes for you. There is a recipe for ginger, a lemon tea, which I make quite often because I love it and it does not taste like Theraflu. And then we've got ginger turmeric latte. So I have made this a few times. Um, there's actually a picture on the blog of one that I made. Um, I'm a very texture sensitive person. I also don't like my skin to be sticky or I'll get very angry. Um, so a sensory, I'm very sensory sensitive. So if you are that type of person, you may not enjoy the latte, um, but if you're not, if textures don't bother you, if uh, it doesn't bother you, if your skin's sticky or your pants sit in a weird angle, um, then you will probably enjoy and benefit from the, from the latte. So definitely do the latte over the tea. The tea is really good for digestive impairment. The latte is good for overall inflammation including digestive impairment. Um, so you've got those recipes there. We got a nice uh, gif of Dr. House drinking some tea. And that is it, it's short and sweet. I don't have my uh, faithful viewers here tonight. So if you're watching this afterwards, feel free to post a comment. I do monitor them, so I will be more than happy to answer any questions that you have in regards to digestive inflammation overall information or turmeric and ginger. And that is it. So I will see you guys next Tuesday. Hold the phone, let me tell you what we're gonna talk about. Next Tuesday, I do this enough, you would think I have all these things up, but that doesn't work that way. Ooh, yay, this is a good topic. So next Tuesday, we're gonna talk all about belly bloat. That's always a fun one. Happens to a lot of people as well, including myself. Um, so we're going to talk all about belly bloat and it's a loud dog, sorry.
talk about belly bloat and some things that we can do to overcome it and how to recognize if you are bloating and not just stuffed. Um, so that is it. I will see you guys next Tuesday. Have a good night. Bye.